This is the AKC, bringing you the Army's own news magazine. We dedicate this edition with respect and affection to the memory of Queen Mary, whose passing mourned by all the peoples of the Commonwealth, and among them, of course, the men and women of the services. Queen Mary. Her familiar presence in Britain's way of life will be greatly missed. Her influence will surely endure, but it will be both strange and sad not to see her any longer taking her active part in the affairs of the nation. Her energy was tireless. Even in her later years, when the ordeal of walking imposed too great a strain, Queen Mary was reluctant to miss any exhibition of national interest, especially if these were connected with the home, with the garden or with family life. At 85 years of age, her memories could go back to a period of easier and more gracious living, to the days when she and King George were Prince and Princess of Wales. Those, of course, were times of different manners, and how remote they seem now, though to many people they still live in the memory as a golden age. That golden age lasted only a few years after the coronation of King George and Queen Mary, it was cut short abruptly by the First World War. In one sense, however, it lasted until the Silver Jubilee, until that great day of rejoicing in May 1935, when the whole British Empire celebrated 25 years of a glorious reign and of truly royal service to the people. After the death of her loved husband, Queen Mary watched her son embracing the same faithful tradition of kingship and King George VI, of revered memory, paid a son's tribute to his parents' example by continuing and enhancing their life work. In the same way, Queen Mary must have rejoiced in the later years of her life to see her granddaughter developing the same royal qualities which she herself had exemplified. Here's a delightful study, the older generation and the sovereign of the future. As a great-grandmother, Queen Mary lived to see another royal generation at the christening of Prince Charles, a film portrait to be remembered, Queen Mary and her great-grandson. And again later at Princess Anne's christening. A tremendous sense of pride must have filled Queen Mary's heart to think that the royal family, her royal family, had established a place of such enduring and loyal affection in the hearts of her people. During February, the first distressing bulletins appeared. Then there was better news, some reassurance. But on the morning of Tuesday, March the 24th, Queen Mary had a relapse. Royal cars driving up to Marlborough House were watched with growing anxiety. She died at 20 minutes past 10 that same evening. The news, of course, could not fail to create a wave of sadness throughout the land. The depth of feeling, indeed, might possibly have surprised Queen Mary, for at 85 the Queen Grandmother was not quite so familiar a public figure as she had been 20 years earlier as the consort of King George V. But in 1953 the public knew her great life story, and their grief was the measure of the respect in which she was held by every British and Empire citizen the world over. And now, on the following Sunday, born from her London home, the funeral procession starts on the first stage of Queen Mary's last journey to Westminster Hall for the lying in state. Draped with her personal standard, the coffin is drawn on a gun carriage of the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. All bearers are colonels of Her Late Majesty's regiments, with the bearer party of guardsmen from the Queen's Company Grenadier Guards marching on either side of the coffin. From the Mall to Horse Guards Parade, the gun carriage moves in sorrowful procession, attended by representative detachments of the services. In 
addition to the Brigade of Guards, the Army's representative detachments included those from Queen Mary's regiments, the 13th, 18th Royal Hussars, the Queen's Royal Regiment, the Royal Buckinghamshire Yeomanry and Queen's own Oxfordshire Hussars, the Queen's own Rifles of Canada, the Surrey Yeomanry and the 50th Field Battery Royal Artillery. Walking immediately behind the coffin come the four royal dukes, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Duke of Windsor, the Duke of Gloucester and the young Duke of Kent. Down Whitehall, already almost prepared for the joyful day of coronation, the coronation that Queen Mary had so fondly hoped to see, the sad cortege proceeds on its way. So, watched by thousands along the route, Queen Mary came to lie in state in Westminster Hall. Palace Yard, the Guard of Honour had been mounted by the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guard. Slowly, the royal coffin was borne into the great hall to be placed where that of Queen Mary's husband, King George V, had lain, and where, so recently, her son, King George VI, had received the final homage of his people. Here, there was a short service attended by the royal family. Presently, Her Majesty the Queen came out with Prince Philip and took leave of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had conducted the service. Now two other heavily veiled royal ladies, Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother with Princess Margaret. Queen Mary's brother, the Earl of Athlone and Princess Alice. And the Earl of Harwood and his brother. And now the long line of mourners came from all parts of the country to pay tribute to a great and good queen. They came in their tens of thousands, and the scene, still so fresh in our memories, the scene that followed the death of our late king, was enacted again. Watched over by gentlemen at arms and yeomen of the guard, her late majesty Queen Mary lay in state beneath the soaring roof of the Palace of Westminster's historic hall. Of her own contribution to the history of her country, time will eventually show the full measure. Queen Mary's devotion to the monarchy, her untiring services to Britain, her personal influence on the age which she graced, these created supreme values which will not be forgotten. <laughs> 